Hello, my name is Gustav Hoyer, and I am a composer. Welcome to the Anachronism Podcast. Welcome back to the Anachronism Podcast. If you joined us last time, you'll remember that we had an invigorating conversation with composer Jeffrey Nitsch. He shared some of his inspiration, both why he entered classical music as a composer and some of his recent work and the projects that he's been pursuing that help tear down the barriers, the austerity of classical music and help bring it to modern audiences. He was very gracious to offer his time last episode and also even further to give me permission to use one of his works for an active listening exercise. I hope for this to become a regular feature of the Anachronism podcast when we'll take a piece of music and we'll examine it from several different sides. We'll look at some of the constituent parts and perhaps some new ways to hear and listen to some of the musical elements that are there. And then at the end of the episode, we'll listen to the whole movement. That'll give us a chance to hear how all the pieces that we focus on during the podcast come together to create a satisfying artistic whole. Uh, Jeffrey Nitsch is Colorado-based, and he is the director of the Entrepreneurship Center for Music at the University of Colorado, Boulder. He's had an excellent career of performing and composing new orchestral and classical music. He's the author of a recent book, The Entrepreneurial Muse, Inspiring Your Career in Classical Music, and that's published by Oxford University Press, and it came out in 2018. And as I mentioned in our last episode, he has a variety of exciting projects coming up involving those things that inspire him. Today, though, we're going to continue our interview with this composer in a slightly different way. We're going to dialogue with Jeff, not through words, but we're going to hear his other voice, perhaps one of his truer voices, the voice of his music itself. And this is music that has no words. This is orchestral music, but it tells a story. And in fact, Dr. Nitsch has been very explicit on his inspiration for this work. And in the show notes, I will share a link to some videos he produced about this larger piece. It was written from his inspiration as a geologist, having studied geology as a student, having a longtime love of the subject. He brought his love of that subject to his first symphony, four movement work called Formations. And today we're going to take a look at the second movement of that symphony. Now, a brief note about what's a symphony. If you're unfamiliar with what a symphony is, a symphony is a form of music that arose in the second half of the 1700s. So that's the late 18th century. Roughly around the time the United States was becoming a nation, the symphony was becoming an artistic entity usually composed of four movements, four contrasting movements, it's scored for a large ensemble, the base of which is large string sections, that's violins, violas, cellos, and basses, augmented with lots of woodwinds, flutes, oboes, clarinets, bassoons, brass instruments, trumpets, French horns, trombones, the tuba, Perhaps the harp, which is like a piano. It's been turned on its side and the strings are plucked. You've seen those very, very large harps that sit on the floor. And then percussion of every kind. And percussion is simply that family of instruments that are are struck or hammered in varying ways. And they provide rhythmic accents or interesting coloristic dimensions to the palette of the orchestra. So the modern orchestra is composed of all of these instruments and Dr. Nitsch has written his symphony to draw on this ensemble. Any composer will tell you it is inviting but it's incredibly daunting to write for such a complex array of instruments. If you think about the compositional process each instrument requires individual music. Each human performer has personalized instructions on what they're supposed to do when the 
downbeat begins. And all of these individual actions, each gesture, even to the smallest, fastest note that's happening on any of the instruments, they all have to line up in time perfectly. And part of the composer's job is to write the music in such a way that it helps the performers and reinforces for the performers when their notes, when their music has to happen. And the best composers know how to bring excitement and something unexpected and at the same time are equipping their players to bring this music to life. All of the colors and the textures of the different instruments come into play. And Dr. Nitsch's work mixes and blends these instruments in some delightful ways. And we're going to listen for those colors, like paints on the canvas that mix and create something greater than each individual. That's what it's like when you have the woodwinds, the instruments that are blown through, overlaid with the instruments that are uh, have hair drawn across them so that they vibrate, those stringed instruments. All of it comes together and gives the sweeping and glorious sound of the symphony orchestra that we have come to know largely through film scores, if not through large orchestral pieces. And so back to Dr. Nitsch's work today, the first symphony he wrote, four movements, it's always a daunting process for a composer to tackle such a degree of complexity and for an ensemble and a type of music, a form of music that has such a rich history from the symphonies of Mozart and Beethoven and Haydn all the way to the modern day of Prokofiev and Mahler, Shostakovich, masterworks in the classical medium. And so for this piece, the second movement is where we're going to focus. It's a shorter movement, and it has an ebullient exploration of the human side of the gold rush. So the broader symphonic work that he's created explores geological forces and geological characteristics and mechanisms. But what's so enchanting about this second movement is that it brings the really obvious human emotions that are associated with a particular geology, gold. Defining of the American West, the gold rush, is the purpose, it's the point of this. And our composer gives us a journey, not into just the human side, but actually the geological reality, and juxtaposes the monumental natural forces that create gold deposits, and the mon monumental human forces that led to statehood and the population of much of the Mountain West in the late 1800s. And so as we go through this piece, I'm first going to take little fragments. We're going to listen to little components, and I'll talk a bit about the colors and textures. We're going to slow down, and although it's a short work, we're going to hold off listen until the end, because I want to give you a flavor of some of the inner workings of this delightful music. The second movement begins with a flourish of hope. Listen in this next fragment for the sound of a bell tree. It's lots of little bells. And the percussionists are sweeping their hand up those bells in a rising, bubbling, effervescent sound. And it's accompanied very subtly by a similar flourish in the harp. See if you can hear the bells and the harp being plucked in this short passage. That's pretty fast. Let's listen again. And don't be fooled. The strings come in right at the end, so it's a little hard to hear. But if you go back and listen carefully, you're going to hear bells and the harp. It's best to have headphones or slow down and really turn it up. It's not that loud. And you'll want to see if you can detect the two layers of color that make that moment of effervescent anticipation. Another thing to note, the direction that the sounds go. It doesn't go from high to low, but from low to high, rising in excitement. It naturally draws our thoughts, our energy up, preparing us for an excitement to come. With the strings entering then, and you just hear a snippet of them, we start to hear a delightful folk tune, like the prospectors in the gold rush of old might have played around the campfire as they dreamt of wealth, prosperity, and success in the Rocky Mountains. Listen to how the rhythm of dancing is sustained with the plucking of the low strings underneath 
the fiddle tune on top. Pretty easy to picture yourself dancing to that exciting and rousing tune. But the composer has something in store for us. Just like the prospector's hopes were not always materialized the way they expected, the music continues, but an irregularity enters in. If you listen carefully, you'll start to hear some peculiar offbeat portions, so that that consistent plucking of the strings beneath begins to be punctuated by brass, and that's not falling on the beat anymore, but it's a little unexpected. And the violin rises and waits for something to happen. Just like the prospectors, the hope bubbling over, waiting in breathless anticipation of a reward that's not coming. The next section is very intriguing. What our composer has done is giving us that pregnant pause. It's not quite silence, but it is a very subtle texture of a few isolated events and such a strong contrast with the vigorous dance music that had just happened, now we hear the emptiness of unfulfilled expectation. It would be tempting to think that this was a mistake. And you do hear some ambient noise because it is a live performance, but you do hear a few subtle plucks and noise elements for a pregnant pause. Our composer then restarts the engine of hope and another wave of optimistic prospectors arrive on the backs of a folk tune. So we hear the tune again, but I'm not going to play that part. We'll wait until we hear the whole movement. But there's a few waves of these prospectors who show up on the back of a dancing folk fiddle. But each time, it's slightly altered. It's not an exact repeat. The melody changes subtly. There are some changes in how it's harmonized, but most importantly, the way other instruments start to interpose on this dance gives you a sense that the prospector's hopes are not going to be simply and naively filled, that this is a hardship, and that the real world of prospecting isn't quite what they were promised. And one stroke that I really appreciate in this work is the sound of steam bursting out. So if you listen carefully to this next fragment, listen to how the tambourine is rolled, and it gives you the sound of steam bursting out of a pipe. The machine and the mining activity has gone beyond hands and hand tools, and now there are elaborate machines that are whirring and crushing ore in the hopes to yield gold. And you can hear as that tambourine rolls, the steam escaping. In another brilliant orchestration, you start to hear the hammering of these hand tools on ore, and at the same time, the rough scraping in the shaker which is the gravel in the mining pans as they look for ore in the river. I can almost smell the forest and hear the river water in the high mountain streams of Colorado and picture miners with pans looking for hope in the rocky water. The mining continues. And near the end of the piece, we hear a geological element. By the composer's own description, the process that would bring gold to the surface, the gold that would drive this rush of human hope, shoots up in a powerful mighty column, a river of rock headed to the surface, bearing the gold within it. And you hear the swell and the might of this powerful force that would leave the gold deposited that these miners so desperately sought.
And now, the gold rush in its full fury. All the gold has been discovered, and now the rich become powerful. The miners, who had hoped for their own wealth and glory, now work for a few who own the mines and control them with gunshots. And with that, our tale of the Old West, of human ambition and greed, and geological forces, powerful and ancient, coming together, Jeffrey Nitsch's Rush, the second movement of his first symphony, Formations. Now here it is in its entirety, and listen to how these pieces come together. Listen to the way the colors of the instruments tell the story that we've just walked through. Again, thank composer Jeffrey Nitsch for sharing his wonderful music with us. I would encourage you to visit his website and learn more about his other works as well. And you'll find a whole video series that describes his first symphony, Foundations, and its inspiration there. And we'll have it in the show notes. In our next episode, we will have a special guest, Amanda Cook. She's a Boston-based editor, writer, and arts administrator, a flute performer, She's the editor-in-chief of the contemporary classical music publication, I Care If You Listen. 
we'll be continuing our exploration of why classical music matters to modern people. I hope you'll join me next time. If you'd like to connect digitally, you can visit my website at gustavhoyer.com or find me on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for joining.